from Studio 16 in the heart of Santa Monica, this is Santa Monica Weekly with your hosts, Chris Baelish and Veronica Castro. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Chris Baelish. And I'm Veronica Castro. Happy Thanksgiving to all of you. It may be a holiday week, but many city services and employees are still hard at work. Here to talk more about a wide range of issues in the city of Santa Monica is Mayor Kevin McKeown. Welcome back to Studio 16. Well, it's great to be back and to be back on this holiday week to, to celebrate all the stuff that's happening in this town. We've had a very exciting year. Big year. A lot yes. to be grateful for. Oh, yeah. That's right. And now, last time you were here, we talked about one of council's priorities, which was affordable housing and inclusion. Now let's talk about a different priority for council, which is mobility. What is the council doing uh, and why did they select mobility to focus on? <laughs> well, as, as far as why we selected, how was your drive in today? It was great. Uh, well, I'm glad to hear that because <laughs> that's not what I hear from most people. Right. Uh, I think one of the main things we council members hear from members of the public is frustration with the amount of traffic in Santa Monica. And there is argument over what the reason for the amount of traffic is. It might be too much local development. It might be regional activity that we can't control. It might be the lack of a meaningful, a meaningful mass transit system. I think that's a big part of it for Santa Monica. But it is the issue practically on the top of everybody's mind because we all deal with it. Every now, day. to be honest, when you deal, when people get most frustrated about traffic, almost invariably, it's because they're behind the wheel themselves at that moment. They're creating the traffic as well as participating. That's right. <laughs> so one of the secrets, I think, and one of the reasons why we chose mobility as a theme, as one of our priorities, is we have to look at ways to get people to use multimodal options of transportation. A car is only one way to get from point A to point B. We have a wonderful big blue bus. We now have the bike share system. We're going to have Expo in a very short time. So we need to start to rethink how people get around within our town. Those errands that we take every day don't always require a car, and that's that much less traffic on the road. Likewise, our schools are an issue. Picking up and dropping off students is a big part of the traffic in the morning and about 3 o'clock every afternoon. Uh, if you try to get anywhere close to school in town uh, at that time of day, you know exactly what I'm talking Good luck. about. Yeah. <laughs> so we're working on safe routes to school. That's another way to, to reduce the amount of traffic. That's great. You know, there's so much going on right now as far as alternate modes of transportation in Santa Monica. So excited that the Breeze Bike Share just launched. What are your hopes for this spectacular program? Every time I go by one of the Breeze Bike Hubs with those green bikes, it puts a big smile on my face. Me too. And I've been grinning a lot because there are 75 of those hubs around the city now. So for the first time, people have the option, without having to pull their own bike out of the garage, to on the spur of the moment, grab a bike and, and take a ride. Now, during the pilot program, we discovered that the average ride was just over a mile in about 15 minutes. These are the types of errands I was talking about that we all make every day that don't require a car. And with the Breeze bike, you have a basket, so you can pick up whatever you're doing. If you decide not to take a bike back, you have that option. If you bring your own bike, you've got to come back home, right, mm -hmm. even if it's uphill. With the Breeze bike, you can ride the downhill leg and take the bus back That's if you want right. to be lazy. So there are lots of options that become available to people we didn't have before we had bike share. And where it's going to really pay off is with Expo coming to town. Because the whole point of Expo is not to use your car, but to get to the station, you have to perhaps travel as much as a mile. What's more perfect for that for many people than a bike? Now, I recognize that not everybody is going to ride a bicycle, and that's fine. Everybody mm -hmm. doesn't have to. If we got 10% of the cars off the road, the traffic in this town would be transformed. Yes. And bike share is one of the elements we're using to help accomplish that. Well, some residents say that they're concerned with some of the hubs in residential neighborhoods, that it'll bring more people into the residential areas of town. But who are the bikes really for? Well, the bikes are for residents as much as for anybody else. I mean, obviously, they'll be used by visitors. And the hubs in the neighborhoods are not there to be destinations. Frankly, there's little reason for a, a visitor to come into a hub in a neighborhood. They're there for the people who live in the neighborhood. So for instance, I now have a hub half a block from my house, which is, is wonderful. So if I want to ride down to City Hall, I can ride down to City Hall. There's a hub at City Hall. If I want to go to the beach, there's a hub at the beach. When I want to come back, I can park it in my neighborhood if I want to. I don't see that as being a negative. I think it's right. being a wonderful positive and it's a real indication of the fact that we mean for these bikes to be used by residents and that's why we put the hubs in the neighborhoods. Now the Breeze Bike Share program is going to take people to public transit like the big blue bus that you mentioned, the new Expo light rail that's going to open in the spring. How is that going to change the way that people get around in our city? 
Well, I think we all have to stop thinking about the only uh, mobility tool you have being your car keys. Right. The truth is you have multiple mobility uh, tools now in Santa Monica. You have that tap pass that's good on the big blue bus and the expo. You have your Breeze bike share uh, membership that lets you get on the bike. And it may take multiple things in multiple situations to be most flexible and have it be most appropriate for what you're doing on that particular day. All we can do and what we're trying very hard to do is to give people choices. Until the last few years in Southern California, because of the historic land use policies and the lack of mass transit, we didn't have a choice. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to go more than a few blocks, you had to hop in your car. Well, in Santa Monica, we're setting a, a, a new policy that no, you, you have multimodal options and you will f f going forward now in Santa Monica. That's great. We also got a look at the draft pedestrian action plan. Can you tell us a little bit about that? That's a very exciting document. I, I brought it with me here. It, it's, it's a book, you know. Wow. Three, seven, and six. There's a lot of stuff in here. But let me just talk about the themes and, and what it is that we're trying to do here. First of all, we're acknowledging that walking is a part of our lifestyle here in Santa Monica. We're a very walkable town. We always have been. People love to walk in Santa Monica. In fact, when tourists come to Santa Monica, one of the things that they comment on is how much fun it is to yeah. walk around this town. <laughs> right. so, so we want to focus on that. We also want to make sure the pedestrians are safe. Now, we've adopted a policy called Vision Zero. And that is the idea that all of our traffic policies should aim at nobody ever getting hurt. Zero accidents, zero injuries. Unachievable, of course, in reality, but as a goal, as a policy, that's what we've adopted. We're trying to make the connections that I was talking about a moment ago between different modes of transportation in different places and remove the obstacles. There are places in town it's very difficult to walk. I just had a conversation yesterday with a young mother who lives near 23rd Street and Hill about how her elementary school daughter is afraid to cross 23rd Street. Mm. With reason, the, tra the traffic is heavy and, and moving fast. Those sorts of impediments to being able to be a pedestrian have to be removed if we're gonna become a successful walking city. And then the last idea is that we're all responsible for our behavior on the streets. We're moving toward what are called shared streets where we have bicycles, pedestrians, and cars, and buses, all and, and now the expo, all using the street. That means we all have to look out for each other. It means when you're a pedestrian, you look out for cars and bikes. When you're on a bike, you're careful about pedestrians. And of course, you know, you're outweighed by cars. You better look out for cars when you're on a bike. As a driver, I need to be more responsible. I need to be more aware of what's around me. I need to make sure that my street uh, speed is appropriate for that street and for the conditions and the other people sharing the street. So the pedestrian action plan will also include education on how we can best be responsible in our use of the streets. Um, this is a beautiful document. Can the, our viewers get their hands on one of these? This can right see now this is a draft. Oh, okay. Hold it up so people can see it. Uh, it's available online. So oh, if you go to the great. city website at smgov.net, it's a pretty large PDF, but it is there as a <laughs> PDF. And I think people will find it's pretty interesting reading. It's quite a visionary look at how we will move into the 21st century and move away from the 20th century automobile-centric Southern California lifestyle that has plagued us for so long. Mayor McKeown, thank you so much. Always a pleasure having you here, and thanks for coming to Studio 16. Well, you're welcome. It's always a pleasure to be here. Thank Great you. Great to have you. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, where we post about all of the fun and important events happening in our city. Hashtag Santa Monica Weekly. It's a wireless world out there. So be sure to stay connected with Santa Monica. Follow us on Twitter for the latest announcements. Receive instant updates on activities citywide. Like us on Facebook and join in on the conversation. Stay connected with your city. And don't miss a tweet. Welcome back to Santa Monica Weekly. We have a special guest in studio with us, Mayor Kevin McKeown. Thanks again for joining us. Well, I, I like it here. I may move in. <laughs> yeah, you've come back many <laughs> you're times. You're welcome. And you're always welcome. You know uh, that. Well, thank you. All right, let's talk about another issue that the council has identified as a high priority, the airport. And we know it's a complicated issue because of the legalities involved, but what can you tell us about this issue? In late August, when the council met to set priorities for the city, 
the reason we did that was our new city manager, Rick Cole, pointed out to us, we were a city with about 25 top five priorities. He said, be helpful <laughs> if you narrow that down a bit for us. So we settled on three main priorities and then two additional we may talk about. But one of the three was the airport. And the reason for that is we've had an ongoing struggle over the impacts of having an airport in Santa Monica. When that airport was created, there weren't all the homes around it that there are now. It's now a very dense residential neighborhood. And if you look at a satellite photo of Santa Monica Airport, it's like an aircraft carrier in a mm. sea of homes. It's really inappropriate. And th the impacts are not only safety and noise, but air pollution, which we're very concerned about. So the council decided that one of our top three priorities for the next few years is going to be regaining our control over that land which we own. Santa Monica owns that land. The airport is operated under an agreement with the FAA, and we had a, uh, an agreement that expired last year, or the middle of this year. Uh, so now we have new options, and, and we've begun to pursue them. So for instance, uh, the airport is actually divided into three parts. I sound a bit like Caesar attacking hmm. Gaul, but uh, <laughs> the airport's divided into three parts. Part of it we already have control over. So we turned uh, some of the aircraft tie downs into new parkland on, on that part of the airport. There is a section called the Western Parcel that we definitely know we're going to get control o over. The question is when, and we're in a struggle with the FAA over their releasing that land for us to take it back. They claim we're under some grant assurances that go for another eight years. We mm. feel those grant assurances have now expired. Yeah. We think the facts are on our side, but the administrative hearing is internal to the FAA. They get to control their own decision making until we finally get it out to a court. So that is why you've seen full page newspaper ads from uh, the city of Santa Monica urging people to get the FAA to do its job because the FAA has been stalling. They have control over the process, and what they've done is month after month after month, they have sent me a letter as mayor saying, we need more time. Hmm. Well, they don't give any explanation of why they need more time. And they know that we want our land back. Uh, mayor Pro Tem Vasquez and Council Member Himmelrich and I and our city attorney all traveled to Washington, D.C. last summer and made our case to the FAA. We've been very clear about the fact that we own that land and we want to make uh, better use of it and more protective use for the residents. So in the meantime, while we're waiting to resolve the legal issues, there have been things that we as a city can do, and that's why we set this as a priority. We're going to hire somebody to, in fact, we're in the process right now of hiring someone to be the airport czar, mm -hmm. somebody whose focus, uh, a staff member at the city, whose focus is on the issues of the airport, because we've all been working on it, but we all have other things to do, so we need somebody with that focus. We also had a council meeting fairly recently where we made some changes having to do with emissions at the airport. As I said, one of the concerns we've always had is air pollution that that airport creates because the piston aircraft run on leaded fuel. You can't buy leaded fuel for your car mm -hmm. anymore. It's a known problem, especially for young people. We know that there is a higher level of lead in the ground in the vicinity of the airport. Mm -hmm. So we decided that from now on, the piston aircraft are going to have to use unleaded fuels. Okay. It can be done. It takes some conversion, et cetera, but that can be done. We also want the jets to move to cleaner, perhaps, biofuels. And if we can't get the existing people who sell fuel at the airport to work with us on that, we're investigating the possibility that we, the city, take over the sale of fuels. Now, you look at what the success we've had with something like the Big Blue Bus. When I first joined the council, the Big Blue Bus ran on dirty diesel. We moved to biodiesel, which was somewhat cleaner. Then we moved to compressed natural gas, which is even cleaner, but of course involves getting the gas and fracking. Now we're using renewable uh, compressed gas, which comes out of landfills, no fracking involved, and we're going to be moving toward electric buses, which will thrill everybody because they'll be much quieter, not only cleaner. So we have a history on this. It's not like we're starting fresh mm -hmm. at the airport. But the airport has been probably the one exception to the sustainability policies of the city of Santa Monica because aircraft are controlled by the Federal Aviation Administration. However, we've determined we do have control over what's sold on our land. We're going to require the people who've been selling fuel for decades to start to remediate the damage to the land because we know there have been leaks of jet fuel, et cetera, in, wow. into the ground, and eventually we're going to get our ground back. We want it clean when we get it. And we're looking at a way to create a cap on the total emissions generated 
by that airport, which affect the neighborhoods around it. Not just greenhouse gas emissions, although that's a very important aspect to us. The amount of carbon being spewed into the air from that airport is horrendous. But also particulate matter. Uh, this is the tiny, tiny little byproducts of the burning of these fuels that lodge in people's lungs that can, can you know, be a health issue for people. So we're addressing the airport now on different fronts. We're, we're, we're going through the legal process. We're going through the administrative process with the FAA. We're building a new park, which is going to be exciting on part of the land, and that may expand as time goes on. But the short-term thing is that with this new airport, Tsar, and with our move on emissions, we're going to clean up that airport. We're going to make that airport a better neighbor in the short term while we work on getting control of the land in the long term. That's great. What kind of input are you getting from residents around the airport and in Santa Monica in general regarding the airport? It's very difficult sometimes because people don't realize how constrained we are in dealing with a federal bureaucracy that is virtually immovable. And I think of myself as an irresistible force, but the <laughs> FAA has been quite a challenge as far as an immovable object. Uh, when I went and made my presentation on behalf of the people of Santa Monica, they listened politely and gave us no feedback, really. They've now stalled us in this administrative process. So what I hear mostly from residents is frustration. People want us to move faster than we can, because if we were to move too far too fast and get ourselves into court with a bad set of facts, we could actually set the cause back 10 years. And in the meantime, we're making all these improvements on emissions because we haven't made a misstep yet. And we hope never to make a misstep. We hope to get control of our land in an orderly fashion that doesn't provoke some kind of a lawsuit where we have a chance of losing. The last thing we want to do is to lose control and have the FAA say, well, from now on, we're running the airport our way, our rules. That's not what we want for Santa Monica. As far as knowing what the people of Santa Monica want us to do, that's pretty easy because of Measure LC, which passed last year. Uh, the aircraft owners tried to pass a very restrictive measure, Measure D, that would have frozen the airport in place and said we couldn't take control of it, we couldn't change anything. We wouldn't even have been able to do these fuel adjustments under Measure D. Uh, what happened instead was residents voted for Measure LC. LC stood for local control. It passed 60 to 40. So we know that residents citywide, not just adjacent to the airport, but citywide, residents by a good majority want us to take control of that land force. So who, who uses the airport exactly? Is it all private and all um, just general aviation flights? The airport's use has changed a lot over the years. I mean, there was a time when it was a general aviation airport, which meant it was mostly private uh, propeller plane hobbyists. owners and hobbyists yeah. and flight schools. And what has happened over the years is that as jets came in and became a business transportation mode, we now have fractional jets and other jet companies there that are flying Hollywood executives and other business types in and out. And there's no doubt it's extraordinarily convenient to be able to fly in and out of Santa Monica if you're a business person as opposed to going through LAX. The problem is, of course, it, the impact it has on other people is just unfair. Uh, we, we all know that capitalism is amoral. And sometimes the government has to step in and make things right. And this is one of those instances where I think we as Santa Monicans have to say, no, it's not okay just because you can afford to fly in and out of Santa Monica Airport for us to allow you to do that in perpetuity and ignore the impacts on residents, the pollution, the noise, and the safety issues. I mean, we've had jets careen off the runway and burst into flames. And if that happens in a residential neighborhood, uh, we will all be very sorry. Yes. Mayor, great information. I feel like I've got a very good understanding of the, the issues surrounding the airport now. We know you're busy. We very much appreciate your time coming into Studio 16. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. And remember, a great resource for many of the things that we've talked about is smgov.net. And also another good resource for city information is Twitter. You can follow the city on Twitter at at Santa Monica City, and also use the hashtag Santa Monica Weekly to see all the fun and interesting stories that we cover here on our show. How far does one dollar go today? Not far, huh? Think again. Los Angeles Regional Food Bank creates four healthy meals with one dollar. We mobilize resources to feed people in need. 
1.7 million people face hunger in Los Angeles County. Help us reach our vision that no one goes hungry in Los Angeles County. And we are back in Studio 16 with a very special guest talking about all sorts of issues and topics important to Santa Monica. Graciously answering all of our questions about the present and future of the city is Mayor Kevin McKeown. Welcome. Well, thank you. The future of the city? I, I, I don't know that I'm an oracle. I'm a mayor. <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> well, let's, let's start out with an issue that's currently very important to the city, homelessness. Yeah, let's start by talking about the annual homeless count. Can you tell us about that? Homelessness has been an issue for our community for a long, long time. And I think we have taken a, an extraordinarily compassionate view. I mean, being without a home is not a crime. Uh, people do things when they're homeless that are criminal, and we, we do pursue those. But we're trying to be compassionate to the people who find themselves on our streets. I've been working on this issue for over 20 years, uh, even before I was a council member. It was one of the reasons why I, I ran for city council, frankly. Things are better now than they've been in a long, long time. We've reduced the number of people on the street because we pursued a policy called Housing First. And what Housing First does is rather than try to get somebody to clean up and get a job and do all these things before they qualify for housing, put that unhoused person into an apartment and guess what? Their other problems fall away because being unhoused makes it so difficult to deal with, with daily life. So that's been a huge success for us. We've gotten a lot of people off the street. Uh, there was a reduction of about 20 percent of the people on the street in Santa Monica since we started doing that. Now the number is starting to creep back up. And that goes to what you talked about, which is the count. The reason why we know so accurately how many people there are unhoused in Santa Monica is that unlike most communities in Southern California, we take a count every year. You're That's supposed to do it every other year, but we do it every year. And it is not only a way to find out how many unhoused people we have, it has become a wonderful community solidarity event where people get together that evening and fan out throughout the city to be part of our community, to care. Uh, and, and to find out just, you know, where people are sleeping at night on our streets. It's a great way to get involved, but also to become aware, like you said. Well, and it's not a transactional process. We don't go out and interview people we find sleeping on the street. We just observe. It's ob observational, not transactional. So nobody's being put at risk by this. Mm -hmm. But everybody who participates feels quite rightly that they're doing a great thing for their community Absolutely. and they get a first-hand look at the fact that there are people you know out there right you know tonight there'll be people sleeping under bushes in our city because they're unhoused and that's a national tragedy where we locally have done our best uh, in the face of a challenging economy sometimes uh, the fact that Santa Monica is such a great destination frankly if I had to be unhoused I think I'd like to be unhoused right. in Santa Monica. What a great place to be. It's the same reason that all of us like to live here. So this is a volunteer event. Mostly volunteers will be fanning out across the city. What will, that, what will exactly happen that evening? The volunteers, this is really interesting, they come from all kinds of groups in Santa Monica and very multicultural. There are uh, uh, Persian-Iranian groups involved and groups that I haven't seen do anything churches. else show up churches for this because it's something that touches everybody. You know, we all have that heart. We realize, you know, especially now we're, we're in Thanksgiving week, how grateful we all are f for the bounty that, that we have. And we realize what it must be like not to have that. And for homeless people, it's not just a matter of not having the material things. The experience is very dehumanizing. So I think it's something where people feel in their hearts that by going out and participating in the count and helping in some way, uh, they are acknowledging the humanity of the people who are living on the streets. We come together, last year it was at St. Monica's, I'm not sure where it'll be this St. year. St. Monica's again. It is this year. Uh, we all come together, we gather, we, we talk a bit about what we're doing and why we're doing it. I got to address the crowd last year as mayor. Uh, and then in teams, we fan out throughout the city. And as I say, it's observational, not transactional. Conversations are not the point. We don't even disturb people. Uh, it's just a matter of observing where people are, what parts of the city, and how many people are out there. Then we all come back and turn in our numbers that we've seen. And it takes a few weeks to generate the citywide count. But then that, the outcome is we have an actual metric, a measurable uh, outcome of how successful our programs are being or perhaps not being. I hope we continue to be successful. Thanks for doing that. And mm -hmm. switching gears, let's talk about the Cradle to Career program and the goals for that program. Cradle to Career is a partnership that we have put together to assure that every young people, uh, every young person in Santa Monica 
gets the opportunity to be the best they can be. Uh, we know that our children are our greatest asset. They are investment in the future. We have always in Santa Monica, for instance, invested in our public school system. And right now the city gives $14 million a year in uncategorical cash to the school, which is why we have such wonderful art and music programs. But that's not enough because the schools are K-12 to or pre-K-12 to or pre-K-14 to if you include the college. And actually, many of the changes that can make somebody's life a more successful and fulfilling life happen before they're five years old. So we've moved from the idea of helping the schools and the college to a cradle to career uh, span. And career may not be exactly the right word because it's not, it's not just a job program. It's how to succeed in life is what it's about. We begin now with parents who are about to have children. They need support and help. A first child is a big change in your lifestyle. Oh, yeah. If you're not ready for it, <laughs> uh, it'll really take you by surprise. Then we work with the infants and toddlers and preschool through school. We work with the college. The main three partners right now are the city of Santa Monica, the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District, and Santa Monica College. But we also have many community partners. So for the part before the schools, we're working with the uh, preschools and uh, child care and early education facilities in town. Uh, then for the career part, I want to talk a little bit about the Hospitality Training Academy. This is something that we have set up here in Santa Monica about a year and a half ago with an initiative from the city council. We put $93,000 from our council contingency funds into setting this up. This is an opportunity for local youth who are looking for work to be trained in one of our big industries, which is hospitality. Now, we also have a program for tech. That's a different field. But for hospitality, this makes a direct contact between the people who are currently in our hotels in town and restaurants and the young people who are looking for work and for whom this could be a career path. And we're not talking about just, hey, we'll train you how to be a waiter and then forget about you. There is a continuum here where people get into management if they're capable of doing that. So the whole idea of cradle to career is to span the whole life of everybody in this city. but. What we've learned is you've got to start extremely young. And in fact, we start pre-birth. Uh, if you can make those changes in those early years, if a child grows up knowing that she or he is loved and supported, and if the community provides the support uh, that encourages education, you know, it's important to have housing. If a family lives in an apartment with too few bedrooms and a child never has the privacy to do her or his homework, that's going to affect them for the rest of their life. So our housing policies fit into this too. I mean, this is a really all-encompassing thing. Our well-being project is involved as well. The Cradle to, to Career, I think, has been one of the great successes in Santa Monica. And if people want to know how to themselves access some of these services, there may be people who are watching who have kids. Uh, maybe there's a woman watching right now who's with child and knows that this, this is coming. What am I going to do? We have a website, and I'll read it off. It is programs.santamonicayouth.net. And it's a program finder. And you enter in the information, the, the age, et cetera, and it'll tell you exactly who to go talk to. So the city is doing a facilitating role what in making cradle to career work. That's a great resource. Amazing. Well. Happy Thanksgiving to you. Happy Thanksgiving to Any all big of us. plans? I'm just thrilled to have a few days off, frankly. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And I'm so grateful to get to live in Santa Monica, right. let alone to be on the council, let alone to have been mayor during this very, very exciting year during which so much is done. And I'm, I'm really grateful for having had that opportunity. Yeah, congratulations to you, everybody at City Hall. You guys have done, had a huge year, really. We have. So we thank have. you for coming in and sharing a little bit of the successes with us. And, and uh, thank you. This is your back. first year, so you should that, be grateful. That's for another first. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thanks for being on our show a couple times, <laughs> too. We appreciate it. Thank you, man. And for all thanks. that you've done. Well, thank you. And thanks to all of you for watching. And remember that you can also watch us on our YouTube channel and leave us some comments. And if you're out having fun doing something interesting in this beautiful seaside city, be sure to post your pics on Instagram and use the hashtag Santa Monica Weekly. Maybe we will put your pictures up on the show. Thanks for joining us and happy Thanksgiving.